point, I would like to introduce this session's uh, first speaker. We have three speakers all together. This is Einhard Schirenberg, and uh, he's coming from the University of Cologne. And like uh, Eugenia, who told us about different ways to construct a frog, we will now hear about different ways that we can build a worm. So, Einhard. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, great. That's uh, really okay. So, um, I want to talk about um, embryogenesis in nematodes. So, it somehow is connected to the previous talk where Virginia talked about the uh, embryogenesis of frogs, and there are some things which are overlapping or are similar, and others are different, and also the approaches are not certainly not the, the same. I searched in Darwin's book to find a good quotation uh, for this occasion, and this is one a very, um, very basic um, statement there. He, he devoted a whole a chapter to development and embryogenesis. Unfortunately, it does not really fit very much to what I'm going to t talk about, because um, he did not know much, and not very much was known at that time at all about uh, early embryogenesis that uh, people talked, uh, like Van Beer or uh, Haeckel, and also Darwin was more the larval stages or the late stages of later stages of embryogenesis, where uh, an organism shaped out of this uh, ball of cells. So um, actually. I must admit that Darwin did not contribute very much to, the, to our questions we have today, but the general background certainly was very important. So let's first look, as a look at uh, nematodes in general that are simple creatures. And they only consist of a few tissues. Uh, here you see in red uh, the epidermis that excretes the cuticle outside. And uh, then there is an alimentary tract consisting of a pharynx and an uh, intestine and an anus. And then there is a body musculature here in green. And uh, uh, then for, uh, the gonad certainly plays a very uh, prominent role for my talk, too, because I'm talking about development of eggs. If you look for nematodes in the soil, and many of our nematodes were found in our backyards or flower pots, and if not there, then in the backyards or flower pots of friends of us, uh, they look very similar to each other. And we believe that uh, the morphological restrictions uh, are due to this uh, single-chambered hydroskeleton. That means the whole body is filled with fluid, with one chamber, and this fluid is under pressure. So if you would poke in, uh, the whole worm would explode. So this kind of uh, construction system restricts the morphological uh, variation. Another interesting thing is that we have uh, large nematodes, for instance, Ascaris, maybe about 40 centimeters in size, and we have tiny ones. Some of our soil nematodes are just half a millimeter long. But they all are derived from small, tiny larvae, uh, which are very similar uh, cell numbers. And a lot of uh, the differences we find are due to post amionic modifications. So the question I want to address today is how much embryonic variations do we find within that phylum of nematoda with its very uniform body plan? And here is a phylogenetic tree of nematodes, uh, a recent one uh, by Holterman et al. Uh, based on uh, DNA sequences. And in this tree, you can define 12 different clades. And for today's talk, I selected five species I want uh, to talk about. Here is our standard C. elegans belonging to clade number nine. They have a relatively close relative called Diploscaptor or D. coronatus. We may find it in the talk as well. And then there's Acrobeloides or Ananus uh, as clade 11. And then I have two examples uh, here which are very distantly related to C. elegans Romanomermis, Culicivorax from clade two, and Trobilus diversi papillatus uh, from clade one. OK, let's go to C. elegans first, because that's well known. And for those who are not uh, very familiar with the development of uh, C. elegans, at least the early development, let me just give you a brief introduction to that. These are the two pronuclei. After, fer uh, after fertilization, they fuse to form the zygote. And then the first 
division starts, and this first division is asymmetric. And uh, this is an important step because uh, with this first division, there is already a separation into germline and soma. And this AB cell here is the first somatic founder cell, and the P1 is uh, the, the germline cell. This germline cell has the ability to go through additional asymmetric divisions, generating a new germline cell and a new somatic founder cell. If you go from the two to four cell stage, you can see it easily here. P1 divides into a P2 cell as a germline cell and an EMS cell, which is the second somatic founder cell, while the AB cell divides into two equally um, uh, equal cells, ABA for anterior and ABP for posterior. And this uh, game continues. I just want to focus here on the germline. So P2 divides into this green somatic cell C and uh, a P3 cell. And uh, as a last step, we have the last asymmetric division, embryonic asymmetric division in the germline, generating a, a somatic founder cell D here and the primordial germ cell P4, which post germinally will only produce uh, germ cells. And this development has been followed uh, cell by cell, so a complete description can be made from the first division up to the adult. And because uh, this can be done, you can also def describe embryogenesis in the form of a lineage tree. And the same thing that is shown here can be seen here too. The zygote P0 divides into an AB cell and the P1 cell, P1 into a P2 and EMS, uh, P2 into P3 and C, and P4 P3 into P4 and D. Each of these lineage branches produces a fixed number of cells, and these cells also have a fixed fate. So in conclusion, we can say fixed number, fixed order, fixed fate, essentially no variation. So this is our starting point, and now we want to ask the question, how much uh, developmental variation do we find in this phylum of nematoda, and I want to focus on, essentially, on the early part of embryogenesis. And here are certain aspects that we have studied and where we found uh, differences. How is axis polarity established? What's about the cell cycle duration, how it is controlled? What's about the cleavage pattern, the order of early, early divisions? How do cells arrange in the early embryo? How does cross-relation proceed? how are tissues formed, uh, what's the mechanism of cell specification, how is, what's the relation between cell lineage and cell fate, and uh, what is the pattern of gene expression. So I give you essentially just one example for each of these points, and then we try to draw some conclusions from that. First thing is the variations concerning axis polarity. Axis polarity certainly is a very important uh, issue in the embryo, you have to know where it will be anterior, posterior, left, right, and droschal ventral. Here I only want to touch the question of the primary axis, the anterior, posterior axis. And in C. elegans, this anterior, posterior axis is established with the entrance of the sperm. This is a gonadal tube here. There are uh, immature uh, germ cells there. They first go to mitosis, then they enter meiosis. And finally here, there's the most mature oocytes and there is a region of the gonad which is called the spermatheca, where tiny sperm are just waiting for the eggs to come. And uh, then uh, what, the sperm enters uh, this uh, oocyte, and where it enters, uh, this will be the, become the later posterior pole. Uh, then this is the uterus here, and the eggs start to cleave, develop, and the posterior pole, that is where the sperm had entered, points towards the vulva, which, where, through which eventually this egg will be laid. Uh, the position of the germline here, of the germline cell, in this case P2, is a very good marker for uh, defining posture. And so I can show you where the uh, germline cell sits, but we certainly have shown it, uh, in detail whether this always coincides with the posterior pole. So here we have C. elegans as our standard, and uh, two species, Acrobeloides and Diploscaptor, which I introduced to you before already. And uh, these are a special type of nematodes because they are parthenogenetic. That means they do not have sperm. So uh, they develop without fertilization. And we can actually ask the question, how do they establish polarity? Although well, no sperm is there in C. elegans, if you don't have sperm, no, no de development starts, no uh, polarity is established. 
So here is the case of C. elegans. Again, as our standard here, this is the vulva. And we find that in 98% of all cases, the posterior pole points towards uh, the vulva. In the other 2%, the sperm comes from the other end. And uh, therefore, polarity is inverted. In any case, development is normal. Uh, in any case here, wherever the sperm enters. But if you look at Ananos acrobaloides, uh, we find it just the other way around. There, in 98% of the cases, the anterior pole points towards the vulva and the germline uh, cell is away from it. But at least there's a kind of fixed polarity there, uh, which is probably induced by uh, slipping through a very narrow uh, part of this gonad. We may even have to make a U-turn. Uh, in Diploscaptor coronatus, we find a different uh, distribution. We find exactly a 50-50% uh, distribution. So there is a kind of randomness there, whether the posterior pole or the anterior pole points towards the vulva. So you see that, first of all, um, um, polarity can be established without a sperm. And second, there are different ways how that can be achieved, either in a fixed way or in a random uh, fashion. OK, let's go on and uh, look for cell cycles. Um, here is a case of C. elegans, our standard. And I just want to look at the divisions of in the AB lineage. The uh, um, question, how long does one cell cycle from one division to the next take? And the answer is in C. elegans, if you start uh, with the two cell stage, cell cycles become longer and longer and longer. If we look at a close relative, which I have not introduced to you, Rabditis bellari, uh, a close relative to C. elegans, the story looks a little bit different. There, in the beginning, the cell cycles become slower, and then they become faster. In another close relative of C. elegans, Rabditis dolichura, um, it is even more extreme. There, cell cycles become slower and slower and slower. And here, there's a pause, a rather long pause about as long as two or three cell cycles would take under normal conditions. And only then uh, cleavage continues. And from that point onwards, it becomes faster again. In Ananos, um, the one from Clade 11, Acrobeloides, uh, cell cycles are very slow in the beginning, and they become faster and faster. And the question is, what does it mean? How can we explain that? And we did experiments with these, blocking transcription, for instance. And then uh, our interpretation is the following. It depends on the availability of maternal gene products. In C. C elegans, a lot of maternal gene products are there controlling most of uh, early development. But uh, these maternal gene products deplete, and uh, therefore um, cell cycles become slower and slower. In uh, uh, Bellari, uh, the maternal gene products explode uh, rather early, but also zygotic gene expression then starts, and they overlap, and therefore we get this kind of curve. In uh, Rhabdotis dolichura, uh, the maternal gene products run out, and there's nothing there to uh, um, continue with cell division. So only later on, the zygotic gene expression is initiated, and therefore we have there a, a pause, a break, where nothing can go on in terms of cell division. And finally, in Ananos, there appears to be very little of maternal gene products, and zygotic gene expression is required very early and there's only little gene product in the beginning, and this amount of gene product increases, and cell cycles can speed up. A general conclusion that one can draw from that is that the combinatorial use of maternal and zygotic gene products can generate any kind of sequence you could imagine in time and space by just regulating it uh, via these two uh, um, independent ways, here the maternal products and their zygotic products. OK, let's look at cleavage pattern. This is C. elegans as our standard. Uh, and you remember that there was a fixed uh, order of cell divisions and also these kind of clear asymmetric uh, divisions there uh, in the germline. Now I want to switch or uh, jump to a, a very distant relative in clade 1 called the Tropilus diversi papillatus. And if you look there at early cleavage, it looks like that. First division equal. 
no uh, possibility to discern a germ line from the soma. Second division, equal, uh, but at right angles to each other. So you get four cells which look very similar to each other. The eight cell stage, one, two, three, four in one layer, another four in the other layer, also there, they look very uh, similar and they behave very similar. So it looks very different to the pattern we find in C. elegans and essentially all other nematodes we have looked at. However, a more detailed study um, reveals that there is a lineage which we call an obscured cell lineage. That means in the very beginning you can see anything, but sooner or later suddenly a cell behaves different and what we could identify so far is a germline, although not from the very beginning, but only after that stage here, and also a, um, a gut lineage uh, there. But it's a kind of a, a delayed establishment of uh, lineage and probably only part of the embryo is fixed by a cell lineage, while others uh, um, do, do not show um, a fixed lineage, but it's more variable there. But that needs to do more work on that to really reveal the very much details on that. But nevertheless, it shows there are very different ways how to uh, proceed during early embryogenesis. Okay, uh, let's look at cell arrangements. Here's an interesting picture showing C. elegans, which is a small nematode, about 1.5 uh, millimeters long, but there are even smaller ones. This is also an adult here of Diploscaptor coronatus, and you see it's um, much smaller than C. elegans, uh, only about 0.5 or 0.6 millimeters long. Uh, but they are belong to the same clade, and uh, so they are relatively closely related. Remember C. elegans, uh, early cleavage, uh, where there is no interspecific variation. Cells are arranged in specific order, uh, and you can give them their names. In Diploscaptor, that's different. First thing you can see, if you look at the four cell stage, this looks different to the four cell stage in uh, C. elegans, because here all cells are arranged in one order. This has important implications that I do not want to talk about today, uh, namely interactions. In C. elegans, there are uh, uh, crucial interactions uh, in the four cell stage between cells, uh, particularly the P2 cell and its neighbors. Here, the P2 cell never touches this ABA cell as it's happening here. And uh, therefore, inductions as found in C. elegans uh, cannot take place the same way. The point I want to make here is that when this one divides, we get two different versions of it. And if each of them divides, they uh, generate another two um, possible uh, positions here. So we have four different versions here. Um, where cells are just located uh, differently and have different neighbors. However, all of these ones merge into one common pattern, as shown here be before the onset of gastrulation. That means if they are lucky like this one, there's no need for any kind of cell migrations. But for the other three ones, cells need to migrate, and they do that, uh, eventually all reaching this pattern where the germline cell is adjacent, adjacent to the yellow gut precursor cell. So there are different patterns to C. elegans, and there is variation, interspecific variation, not found in C. elegans. To demonstrate that, in fact, uh, they really merge into this very same pattern, these are reconstructions of about a 150-cell embryo, and certain uh, parts uh, of the AB lineage have been colored in different colors, and if you compare here an anterior view, a dorsal view, and a ventral view uh, of C. elegans and D. coronatus, you and, not, and me are not able to identify whether this is C. elegans or D. coronatus. They look very, very similar to each other. Okay, uh, let's switch to gastrulation, which is uh, an uh, important uh, part of embryogenesis. And here I show you embryogenesis in um, the sea urchin. With students, we go um, every year to uh, have a marine biology course, and so these pictures are taken by the students looking at the uh, development of the sea urchin. And uh, this uh, stage here is a blastula with a big blastula, blastocele, an empty space inside. And into that empty space, cells invaginate here and they form the, the gut. And you find uh, a similar pattern in many species 
over a, a variety of different uh, animal phyla, and therefore I call it here a canonical gastrulation. If you look for gastrulation, see other guns, it's different. Uh, there is no blastula stage, and there is no blastocell. There are small, tiny spaces between some cells there, but it, essentially there is, seems to be no space to, uh, for cells to migrate in. These two cells here with the asterisks are uh, the gut precursor cells, and they are transferred into the center somehow. Uh, and uh, then here, this is the gut primordium here, consisting of four cells. So gastrulation occurs very early uh, in C. elegans, and uh, uh, only two cells are initially involved. Later on, mesodermal cells follow them, but at a later stage, and uh, there is no blastula stage there. So I call it here a non-canonical uh, gastrulation. And so far, it was thought that um, this is a typical uh, nematode gastrulation, and some change in the gastrulation must have occurred uh, with the emergence of the branch uh, nematoda. But a while ago, we found that is not the, the case. We find also nematodes which show this type of gastrulation that is found in the sea urchin. And this is tuberulose uh, at clade one, which is at the base of uh, the nematodes. Although it looks a little bit different to uh, the sea urchin, nevertheless, there's a single layer of cells there. And there is a blastocell, which can be even larger than is shown here. And eventually, a group of cells uh, migrates in its, uh, invaginates into that blastocell, and then it forms a shape of this kind, which is not too different from the sea urchin or in other nematodes, even Drosophila is not so different there. Uh, so the blastocell uh, so essentially uh, disappears, and this group of cells just invaginates. So we see uh, within the nematodes, we can have very different kinds of gastrulation. All right, now I want to um, introduce you a case of uh, tissue formation. In C. elegans, usually tissues are formed from different lineages. They contribute uh, lineages to, to uh, generate different types of cells. And for instance, uh, um, the nervous system is coming from different lineages, or the pharynx is made from different lineages, and also the hypodermis, which I choose here as an example, uh, is coming from two different lineages. This is a schematic drawing of an early C. elegans embryo. You look from the dorsal side on that. Each circle represents a single cell. And now we have a stage where we have eight AB cells, and, uh, which are the first somatic founder cells, and four C cells, which are the third somatic founder cell. And the colors indicate that uh, these blue and the green ones contribute to hypodermis. And that makes the point. That means not all AB uh, cells contribute to hypodermis, not all C cells contribute to hypodermis, but only a selected number of them. And although the intensity of the color indicates that they contribute to a different uh, percentage. So the rather um, complicated pattern how uh, the hypodermis cells arise. The uh, AB cells uh, cover uh, essentially the anterior part of the uh, embryo and the C cells, the posterior part of uh, the embryo, so that eventually the whole embryo is somehow covered by hypodermal cells. We have a species uh, that we study, it's called Romanomermis, uh, and uh, it's, it belongs to clade two. And I want to make the point that their hypodermis formation is made a completely different way. As I said here, it is coming from A, B, and C. A, B is the first somatic founder cell, C the third one. Here, it comes from what we call the S2 cell, which corresponds to the EMS cell in C. elegans, the second somatic founder cell. That wouldn't be so surprising, but the pattern how it is generated also differs completely. Um, this S2 cell divides in a left-right fashion, making two daughter cells, and then it continues to, uh, to divide left-right, which is something which is not seen in C. elegans at all, these um, uh, consecutive left-right divisions. The end of it is a ring of cells containing, consisting of eight cells. Six of them, blue here, are future hypodermis cells. Two black ones on the bottom are future uh, muscles, body muscle cells. And then something happens which also never can be observed in C. elegans. This ring duplicates. 
So out of one ring, two rings are made. Then out of this, uh, each of these rings duplicates again, so we get uh, four rings instead of uh, two rings. And another duplication round comes, so out of, uh, of uh, cell specification that differs between C elegans and another nematode. This is here C elegans, and uh, experiments have shown that this uh, embryo of C elegans uh, does not show any kind of regulation. That means if you take away a cell, it is not replaced uh, by another cell, and this embryo uh, will not develop, proper, develop properly because things are important, things are missing this way. This is Ananos, belongs to clade 11, and there we found that the regulation is there, at least in the early embryo. And I will show you uh, why we can say that and how that looks like. This here is just a schematic representation of uh, in the early embryo, where in an anterior posterior sequence, cells are arranged, A, B, E, M, S, C, D, and P4, as you have seen in C. elegans. In the intact embryo, uh, it is not a, a linear sequence, but formally, and if you remove the eggshell, you get this nice linear sequence <laughs> again. So anyway, so in formal, uh, we can easily say that it's all a series of anterior posterior divisions in the germline, which generates this sequence of cells. Now, if we kill cells, in this case, this uh, symbol here should uh, tell you that the laser beam a cell was killed. And you should also um, see that these colors should identify cell fates. So if, for instance, this EMS cell is killed, as shown here, now the C cell, which is usually makes green fate, now suddenly makes the brown fate of EMS, and the D cell, which usually makes a purple fate, now makes the, green, uh, the fate of the, of the green C cell. If you repeat the same experiment and just kill the AB cell, and I must tell, tell you that this AB cell is a very, very prominent cell. It's the first somatic founder cell, and it produces about two-thirds of all cells of the hatching worm. If you kill that AB cell, uh, then the EMS, oh, the MS is lost there, I see. The EMS cell uh, takes over the fate of the AB cell. The C cell takes fate, the fate, over the fate of an EMS, and so on. Um, so there seems to be a kind of a hierarchical replacement of cells always from posterior to anterior, but you never uh, see that a replacement takes place the other way around. So if we uh, kill a D cell, the C cell will never take over the D fate as if nobody wants to be the last one, but everybody wants to be the first one uh, there. So there is a competition for a primary fate, as we call that. And uh, this is the model that uh, somehow explains our finding. Here is the zygote, P0, which divides into a two-cell stage, AB and P1. And uh, our experiments indicate that this AB cell, in contrast to C. elegans, um, has uh, uh, the potential to execute two different fates. The primary fate, which would be an AB fate, whatever that implies, all the neurons, or most of the neurons, and the piece of pharynx, and so on. It's just an AB fate. And, but it also has the potential uh, for an, uh, an EMS uh, fate. And this, I haven't shown you that, but you will see that in the, last, in the next slide why I can say that. Um, so this, is, this has uh, two potentials. And then the EMS cell is born. And also the EMS cell has two potentials. It can produce uh, its regular EMS fate, but it also can produce the AB fate, as has been shown in this experiment. So uh, we claim that uh, there is an inhibitive interaction in that the EMS cell is inhibited by the AB cell to, to generate this primary fate, and only as if AB is absent, it, uh, the primary fate is executed. On the other hand, this interaction is reciprocal. That means that the EMS cell prevents that uh, the AB cell can make a secondary fate, uh, and therefore, nicely, now AB makes a primary and EMS makes a secondary. But also the C cell uh, has the option to either generate or execute the secondary fate or the tertiary fate. And there the EMS cell inhibits the C to make the secondary uh, fate. And only if, if EMS is missing, C will execute the secondary fate. And so then we come nicely up with the sequence primary fate, secondary fate, tertiary fate. Okay, now I'm coming to the most complicated part or slide of my talk. 
and I lead you through it. Um, uh, but it's interesting, I think. <coughs> Here we compare three different uh, species: C. elegans, clade nine; uh, Ananos, clade eleven; and Romanomerzicus cultivorax, clade two. This is lineage tree, as you can certainly uh, see, and at the bottom of the lineage tree there are circles, and these circles. Uh, represent cell fates. Blue is neurons, for instance, green is pharynx, yellow is gut, and so on. It doesn't matter in our age very much what it is. Um, what can we learn from uh, this C. elegans picture here? Um, we can learn that here the AB lineage, which also could be called S1 lineage, um, is polyclonal. That means that uh, the lineage branches, even at a stage where there are 32 AP cells, um, nearly all of them uh, will execute different cell fates, at, at least two different fates uh, by branching into different uh, subclones. Um, so that is polyclonal there. In Ananos, this has not been studied in very much in detail, but it looks as if this is uh, rather or very similar to the situation as found in S. elegans. In fine details, it may differ, but the principle is the same. However, uh, if you look here in the Romanomermis uh, lineage, there are two things that are different. The first thing, if you look at this uh, first somatic founder cell, which we call S1, and that's the reason why I always switch back, back and forth between AB and S1, we do not dare to call it AB because this one has a different fate. This S1 founder cell, on the one hand, generates AB-like cells, means neurons, uh, and in addition, it also generates uh, EMS-like cells, it means cells generating pharynx and the gut. So in Romanomerimus, this as one, this first somatic founder cell uh, with a grain of salt um, includes two fates in C. elegans, the AB plus the EMS fate, this one and that one. That's the first uh, major differences we observe there. The second one is that we have predominantly, maybe exclusively, monoclonal lineages at this stage. That means it looks as if all neurons come from one founder cell. Then here we have the, the pharynx cells are here. Um, and then the hypodermis cells are there. So this uh, polyclonal lineages found in C. elegans are not there. It looks uh, more than very early cell groups are set aside, you make the neurons, I do the gut, you do the hypodermis, uh, I do the body muscle cells. Okay, that's interesting in itself and it becomes even more interesting if you uh, do some experiments. So this is the same uh, group of uh, nematodes here and there's a, just one single and simple experiment has been done to kill the, AB, uh, the P1 cell and ask what the AB cells are doing. This experiment here has not been done by us, but has been done in the Schnabel uh, laboratory, and we just inclu included it here uh, because it's interesting. If you kill the P1 cell, in this case in the background of a specific mutant, but it doesn't matter for the moment, uh, if you kill the P1 cell, this diversity within the AB lineage is lost. That means that the AB cells always make neurons, plus uh, these black uh, colors is uh, programmed cell death. So this uh, indicates that this cell, cell signaling plays a very important role in the cell specification in C. elegans. So P the B1 signaling induces uh, cell fades because these cell fades are missing now when you take away P1. If you do the same experiment with Ananos, and we did it a number of years ago, the outcome is different. P1 is, is killed here, and what we see now, if you observe uh, this AB cell or S1 cell, now this AB cell makes cell fades it did not do before. That means now this AB cell uh, executes cell fades which are typical for this EMS cell, uh, pharynx and gut. And that was the reason why in the previous slide I claimed that, uh, but here now I can show it. That means without the uh, uh, P1 cell, the EMS cell uh, executes uh, an additional fate. This is as one cell. So um, now this is one cell is like AB plus uh, EMS, and that reminds us 
of Hermann Merrill's Kunitzi Vorax, where in, under normal conditions we have the same situation that means the first founder cell generates a B like fate and EMS like fate. If we now go to uh, the Romano Mermes and do the same experiment, we do not find any changes. So, in Cialic elegance, it looks as if we run signals to induce specific cell fates in the Romano Mermes and Ananos P1 signaling uh, represses certain cell fates which, which are now executed if it's gone. And uh, for this aspect at least, P1 signaling is apparently absent in Romano Mermes. Okay, now, um, one example for uh, gene expression patterns, and we do not have very many of them, but this one is a nice example, I think. Um, there's a gene called PEL1. It doesn't matter what it ma makes. It is involved in uh, determining posterior sulfate. And this is a picture taken from a Hunter and Kenyon paper where you should see something which is not very clear in this picture here, that uh, uh, posterior cells, daughter cells, should have a higher uh, amount of PEL1 than anterior ones. But what comes out here is that during early embryogenesis, uh, PEL1 is restricted to uh, posterior, few posterior cells, and eventually it's just left in the germline here in P4, and then it's gone completely. Everything is not gone before the onset and gastrulation, uh, which starts at the 26 cell stage. There's another interesting gene, MEX3, and PEL1 and MEX3 interact with each other, uh, which determines anterior fate. And uh, in C. elegans, uh, MEX3 uh, is distributed unequally as is PAL1, but it is uh, distributed to the anterior cells. So MEX1 is found in the anterior cells, PAL1 is found in posterior cells, and uh, they exclude each other uh, from the place where they should not be. Also here, eventually it's only found in the germline, uh, germline cell, and then it's uh, lost, uh, it's gone completely. Uh, when um, gastrulation starts. Let's look, uh, so differential localization of the messenger RNA is early and is maternal. If we look in decoronatus, which belongs to the same clade as uh, C. elegans, uh, and look for the PEL1 expression there, it also goes very early to the posterior uh, pole there, like it is going here, and eventually it's only found in the germline. Up to that point, it's the same as in C. elegans. But then, later, oh, at the, uh, at the um, uh, several hundred cell stage, suddenly there is a zygotic uh, expression in the posterior region, which is absent in C. elegans. And if you uh, look at the MEX3, essentially the same thing is found. Uh, that means there is an expression in the anterior part much, much later than in C. elegans, although this is a zygotic expression and the maternal expression is at the posterior pole. So here, the maternal message, both of them go to the same direction posteriorly, while in C. elegans, the one goes to the anterior one to the posterior one. So this is a really difference, and uh, only the, the zygotic expression at a much later stage, there we get the differentiation between anterior and posterior between these genes, and uh, it looks as if the specification of, uh, of cells occurs much later and is... Uh, due to zygotic gene expression. Okay, I come to summary and conclusion right now. Uh, one conclusion has been already drawn in 18, 1882 uh, by the punch. Uh, man is but a worm, and I think now I understand why I can say this, and I uh, completely agree on that. I want to give the acknowledgement to people in the lab uh, that did uh, the work, and you see that as often they just worked on a specific species and uh, some of them looked at specific genes. I could not find time to talk about genome structure differences in uh, nematodes. Um, in conclusion, nematodes show a high degree of developmental variations during early development affecting a variety of aspects. Some variations are obviously correlated with the position in the phylogenetic tree, what we can call it an evolutionary trend. Others are not, and I call them a local variation. Um, sooner or later, these variations merge into a single common pattern. And uh, so that means that early uh, uh, embryonic variations usually do not lead to morphological or physiological modifications of the Hatch juvenile. But nevertheless, they may be adaptive in that they affect the tempo of development, and we find ranges of more than 40-fold uh, in, the, in the duration of embryogenesis. And also, they may affect uh, the economy. 
of uh, development. Okay, just to give you a, a, an idea what it could mean uh, that you get the same result, but you can, there may different ways lead to that. I just call it here the Speedy Gonzalez strategy. That means uh, you are want to uh, perform emergence very fast, but it may be uh, energy consumpting. This is the low carb strategy, which may take a longer there, but you may save energy this way. Just a kind of an idea and a picture of that. On the other hand, um, most or all of the variants I described merge into a common pattern and coexist in the nematode world. And therefore, selective pressure must be low on this early phase of embryogenesis. Um, I imagine that development within that protective eggshell uh, it may be a playground to test alternative developmental pathways at low risk because eventually they merge into the common pattern again. And uh, comparative embryolo embryology allows us to trace the evolution from a probably a slow developing ancestor with regulative development and a late interacting cell network to the modern C. elegans type with early specification and a tight control from the very beginning. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, one over there. Uh, could, could it be that in maybe in at least some nematodes, the regulative de development uh, extends to also to the germline? Can you repeat the question? Uh, could it be that the regulative development in some nematodes the, um, extend to the germline? That if you remove the the germline, uh, another cell could uh, oh, adopt oh, 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 this. Oh, oh, I understand the question. Whether the germline can be replaced by an, another cell. Uh, in our experiments, no, no, not, never. So we can remove uh, the germline uh, P1, P2, P3, P4. It's never, never taken over uh, by any other cell. But this is probably not, um, or it's certainly not restricted to the germline itself. But as I showed, you always can um, or in some nematodes, you can replace cells in one direction to the, from a late uh, arising cell to an early arising cell. An EMS can replace the AB cell, and a C cell can replace the EMS cell, but never the other way around. So an EMS cell never replaces a C cell, and also uh, a somatic cell never replaces a germline cell. Nama? Um, is there a way to make hybrids between um, different nematodes that have different patterns of uh, cell fate specification and see what happens in the hybrid? Uh, in theory, it would be possible. Maybe I can uh, explain what uh, it means. Um, people have uh, made nice experiments by isolating individual blastomere cells out of an embryo and recombining them again uh, by um, just putting together uh, blastomeres from different uh, embryos, let's say putting an EMS cell and putting a P2 cell from one embryo and a P2 cell from another embryo uh, there and uh, see what the effect of that is. So this is a powerful technique to um, understand where cell-cell interaction plays a role. And it would be fantastic if one could also make um, uh, chimeras coming from different species. So far, that has not been successful. Um, with few exceptions, uh, the early embryo uh, are very sensitive. So if you take for instance, ananos, we tried very hard to isolate certain blastomeres. The development is so much slower than uh, in the beginning in ananos, it takes five to 10 times uh, longer to start first divisions. So we were not able to have them survive in a, a cultural medium for longer periods. So, so far it has not been possible to uh, fuse cells or to combine cells from different species. But that would be certainly helpful to identify whether certain signals uh, can work from, uh, across species. What, what do you think would happen? Do you think it would be some of the program would be dominated or there would be a completely new program would come up? Um, I can speculate, but I'm not sure whether my speculation is right. Uh, I would say yes, there are certainly signals are preserved there to so work, so I would be somewhat surprised if a germline cell could not induce uh, a, a somatic cell uh, there, but there are um, quite intricate interactions during later development and that may be altered and changed. I would, I would expect that some interactions, some signaling works and other signal would not work. 
I have a question about the first here. Oh, where is here? Yeah. Okay, there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it's about the first part of the talk. Does the position uh, where the sperm penetrate the outside have some bias where the axis will form? Yes, it is not only bias, but it uh, definitely forms the axis. I mean, it causes the establishment of the axis. So there were nice experiments uh, done in another lab where uh, um, the position of the uh, oocyte could be somewhat changed so that the sperm could enter from the one or the other side, and wherever the, uh, the sperm enters, the posterior pole will be established. So, so uh, does the sperm ever prefer the placed oh, on the member uh, to no, penetrate? No, no, apparently not. There's no indication so that the stochastic. sperm itself would prefer a specific place where to enter. It can enter at any position of uh, the oocyte. And I, let me tell uh, one experiment with, uh, I've done many years ago. With a laser, I fused oocytes, making a giant oocyte. And I wanted to know whether still development will go on normally when it's fertilized by sperm. And the answer is yes, you can make giant worms by using giant oocytes and have the sperm enter that at one place. If I make giant, giant uh, uh, oocytes by fusing several um, oocytes, uh, a sperm enters, but the polyspermy block, which usually uh, blocks the entrance of additional sperm very rapidly, apparently does not work or not work fast enough in these giant oocytes. So there's a chance for another sperm to enter that. So under specific conditions, two sperm can enter uh, the egg, and then you get, can get two posterior poles. Wow, thank you. Okay, unfortunately, we must move on to the next talk. Uh, thank you very much to Einhardt.